Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the News Behind the News with Ralph Kentav. And it is Friday. I hope that you guys had a great week and uh, hoping that you also have a great weekend when it comes. Uh, today on the show, I have with me Mr. Arun Jaktiani. Uh, my apologies. He is the owner uh, and founder of Island Real Estate Team. Um, also have been, you know, have a... Uh, some experience in the media field as far as interviews is concerned. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, I did appreciate and love the interviews that you did uh, during election time. Um, Thank you. I think yeah. it was twice? Twice, yeah. yeah, yeah. Done two, two seasons of that, if you will. Yes, and hopefully the next one is done a couple of years from now. Yeah, it should, be, it should only be four years, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so good afternoon. Thank you for coming on the program. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ralph. And uh, good afternoon to all the radio listeners and those of us, those watching it online. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Pleasure. Great. Yeah. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, part of the reason why I brought you on here is because, uh, you know, months ago, uh, there was a little stir that, yes. that took place in our, in our society as far as uh, the conversations on long lease uh, yes. is concerned, um, as well as um, uh, pr proposals. So nothing that's set in stone, but Correct. proposals that came from the, the IMF or the World Bank, I believe. And also, I mean, it, it, it was also recommended by CFT as well. Um, but nevertheless, that relates to the issue of land, and you know so, when yeah. we start talking about land tax and sure. um, taking away of long lease land, uh, people get antsy. You could say, yeah. Uh, of course, um, curious and, and, and concerned, uh, mm -hmm. rightfully so. But uh, yeah, I think overall, it has since it has died down since. But you know, we could still use Absolutely. clarity where all of that is concerned. Um, but before we get into that, Arun, I guess could you. Tell us a bit about, you know, how did you get into the real, real estate industry? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ralph. Um, so I was born in St. Martin. Uh, my parents originally from India. They came here on a honeymoon and never left. So my brother and I had the blessing of being born here. Um, through my years, through my education years, I lived in New Jersey, London, Miami. I kind of moved around with family. Um, and also, also in St. Martin, of course, for education. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I was growing up, my mom used to give me a lot of these self-help books. Uh, so from teenage age, she just always used to be giving me different books to read. And some of them I read, some of them just brushed aside. But um, in a lot of these, a common theme I found was, uh, I remember reading, I was probably 15, 16 years old when I read this, where um, one of the books said 80% of the millionaires in the world accumulate their wealth through real estate. Mm. And that kind of planted a seed in my head like, Real estate maybe is a, a field to look into as I, as I mature, you know? And that seed was planted. And then um, in 2000, I was attending Florida International University in Miami. Um, and I, I got a real estate license on the side. So in addition to being in school, I got a re real estate was just exploding in Miami. Yeah. So I, I saw the opportunity there. I got my real estate license. And my plan was actually after graduating to work in real estate in Miami. And I had not been back in St. Martin for about a year and change. I came home for Christmas in 2002. And I was like, what the hell am I doing in Florida, man? This is home. Home is where the heart is. So I literally packed my bags in January 2003, moved back to St. Martin. I've been working in real estate ever since. Wow. Yeah. And, and do you need a license to operate here in St. Martin? So in St. Martin, as to work as a broker agent, you do not need to be licensed. Okay. Um, whereas in the United States, it's a very strict process. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was intense to get licensed in Florida. It was as hard as any college course I did, if not harder. Um, and I definitely learned a lot. But here you do not need to be uh, licensed. But I do want to say the industry here, it is somewhat self-regulated. We are such a small population. Everyone kind of knows everyone or, or word gets around pretty quickly. So if you are doing a lot of shady stuff, it'll catch up to you sooner or later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't think you'll be able to build a career long term. Mm. Um if you're building it on un unethical practices, gotcha. Uh, for the for the most part, yeah, yeah, yeah. for yeah. the most part, for the most part, yeah. I got. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you um, you spoke about how the the real estate license test was because um, right now, time even some time some time back, I noticed that's one of the go to things that people tend to do. Um, when I was back in school, sure, like, several sure. of my classmates were like, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to get a real estate license. So what what exactly? You, did you have to, what were the courses like? What exactly do you have so to it was, it was to? Um, There's a couple different versions of the course. First, you have to pass the, so you have to enroll in the, in the real estate school. Mm -hmm. um, I did Gold Coast School of Real Estate, I think, in South Florida. Uh, that was like a one-month course, if I remember correctly. You have to pass their exam, and then that qualifies you to take the state exam. Um, mm -hmm. And then once you pass the state exam, then you're allowed to work in real estate. 
but you actually have to spend the first two years working under somebody. Gotcha. And then you can move up to what's called a broker. You can apply to do your broker's license. Gotcha. And a broker is allowed to have agents working under them. Gotcha. Basically, yeah. Okay. And so what was the process like uh, for you setting up home, you know, um, building clients, building clientele, uh, as well as, uh, yeah, set, setting up yourself as a, as a businessman? It, it's hard work. Um, it, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice. And it's one of those things sometimes if you knew up front how much work was required, you might not do it. Mm -hmm. But once you're in it, you just go, you put your head down. And um, I think I mentioned to you just before while we were setting up, uh, I've been serving this industry now in St. Martin for 18 years. And I've been putting in, you know, 50, 60 hours a week for the yeah. most part. So it's been a lot of hard work, um, a lot of sacrifice, but it's also very rewarding as well. So yeah. I've enjoyed the journey and um, I've definitely come a long way. Yeah. So for a good portion of my career as well is, um, you know, I was waiting tables at night because I was not making money in real estate. There is very few barriers to entry, let's say, to get into real estate. But it is if you're working as a broker agent, it's really commission based. And when someone's buying a home. It's the largest transaction they're ever going to make with their personal money, mm -hmm. with their personal money for the mm -hmm. most part. Yeah. So they naturally are not going to go to somebody new. Right. They're going to be looking for an established. Yeah. Someone who has experience. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to break into the business, that's a major hurdle to overcome. So you really have to work hard at it, pay your dues. But most likely you'll start off doing rentals. Um, and then gradually earning the right to build up to sales. Yeah. But it's um, it's it's a steep ladder to climb. And um, and there's definitely some major challenges you're going to face when when you try to climb that ladder. Indeed, because I, I think about it being similar to uh, journalism as far as credibility is concerned. Yeah, for sure. Like, credibility well makes a big you. Um, yeah. If people don't see you as reliable, again, it, with, with, with news, well, you know, people want to ensure that who they get in the news from is someone who's not biased Absolutely. and independent. Yeah, and for I, sure. As a, well as a broker. That's, you know, a, that's a great comparison. I never thought of that, but yeah. it's a v very because, relevant. Because the, 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 the level of trust is so high, it, it's course. something you can't afford to... You to have shine. to know you can believe what this person is telling you. Yeah. Um, yes, from journalism or from, you know, purchasing a home. Yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's very it's, serious. Yeah. So um, I, I know that uh, when you... So you, as you said, when you came back home, you worked for a company, but eventually you went on to, to start your own. Correct. Um, so so uh, during the time you started your own was... Uh, I think late, late 2000s? 2009. So I came back. Uh, I worked for one of the large international brands that, that's on island. And uh, I worked for them for three years. Then I worked for another large international brand, which was uh, which also operates on the island. And then in 2009, uh, I started my own, uh, my own brand, Island Real Estate Team. Mm -hmm. So I spent six years basically working for these large companies. And I went to their international conventions. I really learn the business from the ground up. And from both of those companies, I saw things I liked and things I didn't like. And um, then 2009, the world was in recession, right? So what I noticed was all the big players in the business, and I was still a young boy in the business, I was still very much paying my dues and, mm -hmm. and um, not really one of the top producers on island at that point. Uh, but I saw the top producers were taking time off because <laughs> the, um, yeah, the, the global crisis, there was hardly any transactions happening which was due so, to the housing crisis as well yeah yeah <laughs> from from the u.s yeah, right so yeah. they say you know when the u.s sneezes the rest of the world catches the cold yeah so yeah there was you know hardly any economic activity happening in 2009 so all the big players in real estate here in st martin were kind of on vacation and i saw this as an opportunity i was like yeah. i'll make a lot of noise i'll be like the the mouse in front of a flashlight i'm yeah. gonna look like a monster on the wall so i put all my savings i put everything i had into it and it lasts a lot. The recession lasts a lot longer than I thought, <laughs> right? So I was out at sea, no money left. I throw it on all into advertising to to almost sort of pretend like I was this you know yeah, big yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. And um, and there I was. So then I went back to waiting tables. To tell you the truth, I didn't quit on my dream. I just kept working and working. And there was some times where I remember I used to say to myself, "Man." I've got to be the most underpaid person on this island. <laughs> my skill set and the hours I'm putting in, this ain't right. Yeah. But I paid my dues and. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it all worked out in the end. Cool. So, um, so now I guess where, where that's concerned, um, uh, one of the things that that makes a, uh, any company, but I can imagine, especially one like yours, successful, mm -hmm. is having a good team. For sure. Uh, what was yeah. it like in, in, in building a team, especially ensuring that you know, because you're still in a competitive field, even sure, with yeah. the persons you're working with. Absolutely. How, yeah. How do you manage that? It's a strange dynamic in a way because it's a, it, the nature of the business is competition. It, it is very competitive. Very, yeah. Very. And a lot of times we're in situations where there's you know, a fair amount of money on the table. Um, it's important to have a set of guiding principles and integrity to, to make the right decisions um, and just doing right by people. 
uh, as well. So I've had very little turnover on my team. Um, I've been blessed. I'm grateful for the people that have come into my life at the right time. So, um, yeah, definitely blessed. I've got great support team around me, um, and we help each other. So there, although there is competition between us in the office, we're able to keep it as friendly competition. Um, and then certainly we compete with, you know, it, it, with others outside of our office. It's, it's a very competitive industry. Um, and yeah, again, we just try to follow our guiding principles and, uh, and ethics and values and, uh, you know, the saying I, I tell all my agents and myself, I remind every day is, listen, it's important you wake up, put your best effort forward and hold your head high regardless, you know, live with the results. Yeah. So that's, you know, uh, definitely advice I've been following and I encourage it. Really, every entrepreneur to listen to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Give your best effort and live with it. So considering the fact that, you know, Simone has this totally, um, the physical landscape of the island is totally yeah. different from what it was in the past. Oh, yeah. Um, it's not much yeah, more built sure. up and stuff. For sure. Would you say that? We've passed the glory days, or, or is the industry, like, how do you see the industry um, looking forward, moving forward? So, relating just to real estate in general, or like t or as a tourism product? Oh, uh, real estate, real estate. Real estate, I th it's very interesting times in real estate right now. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's bittersweet in some ways if you look at the development. Um, I look at some of these old pictures of St. Martin from like, the 1960s and 70s. I saw something on Facebook this morning, which was just absolutely gorgeous. Um, before I was even born, a picture of the Salt Pond in Phillipsburg. Uh, and, yeah. Oh, stunning. Those pictures before my well. time. Yeah, yeah. And it's beautiful. And yeah, in, in a way, I wish we could have that as well. But we got to realize as well, having that St. Martin means none of us exist here, right? Because In the sense that the population at that time was Way. maybe 10,000 people, you know, oh, 20,000 yeah, people. At that time, very low. Yeah, yeah exactly. So... Um, the quality of life that we all enjoy in this island did not exist then. So it's, it's a, it's a trade-off. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. But we can't go back to that. We have to just accept. So we're in this situation. Um, we are a pretty developed island. Um, I think per capita, we're one of the most developed in the Caribbean. Yes. Um, and in terms, in terms of density. Yeah, yes. in terms of density. And that is what it is. But it's in terms of real estate, it's a very exciting time right now. Uh, there's some interesting developments happening. Um, there's good examples and bad examples of yeah, new developments yeah. that are happening, yeah, let's yeah. say. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of interest from around the world, uh, from people who'd love to have a second or third home here in St. Martin. And there's that drives up values, and that also comes with a good side and a bad side to it. Yeah, Yeah, indeed. Yeah, because yeah. I'm glad you, you said that, because uh, the next question I have for you is in terms of how... Uh, if you could, as just, just, just detail mm -hmm. the role real estate, real estate plays in, in our economy as a whole, uh, how important it is for tourism. That's a that's a great question, um, and I think sadly it's something that's grossly overlooked by a lot of our leaders on this island. So for me, look, we're a tourism based economy. There, there's no dispute in that. Everyone knows that. Um, then if we look at the type of visitors that we get. Uh, you know, you have your cruise passengers, you have your hotel guests, you have timeshare owners, you have people that come in and rent villas, and then you have people that come here that own a property here on island. And if you look at the contribution towards the economy, the overall wheels of the economy, somebody who buys a second or third home here in St. Martin as a vacation property is by far the most important tourism demographic we have. Like, the amount that they contribute to the economy is... You can't even compare. I think it, it will probably add up to more than all the other groups of tourism combined. Uh, and I don't know the numbers, but I'm sure it's on that level um, to, to that extent. And I, again, I think it's grossly overlooked by a lot of our leaders and also. decision makers. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, so if somebody purchases a, a, a second or third home here, one, this is somebody with a large disposable income. They're injecting when they purchase this property anywhere from a few hundred thousand dollars, maybe up into the millions. Yes, that's an immediate injection into the economy. Um, they pay an immediate transfer tax. So they're paying, on top of that sale price, they're paying you know close to 5 6% at the notary on the day they become the owner. That's significant for the economy, yeah? Um, and then also, you know, from that transaction, you have people such as myself uh, that make a living. Myself, you have uh, housekeepers, you have gardeners, you have engineers, architects, so many other supporting businesses that will get impacted by a real estate transaction. You know, so now the house is sold. They either had it fixed up before it sold or right after it sold, right? So there's contracts. There's 
upkeep. stimulation throughout the economy on all different levels. Okay. And then these are all local businesses, again, such as myself, housekeepers, care contractors, et cetera, et cetera. These are all local businesses that now in turn pay taxes um, or should be paying taxes, let's say, yeah? Um, so the, the, the economic spinoff is so hard to measure, but it's really ongoing. It's not a trickle-down effect. It's a, it's a raining effect. It makes it rain on our economy, yeah, literally when you have a lot of real estate transactions. Um, and again, the contribution of the person who has a second or third home here in St. Martin, let's look in time of crisis. So let's take post Irma, the worst crisis we've had in our history. You know who was the first people booking flights to come here? People that own a property here. They saw on CNN the disaster, and they couldn't wait to come in and check on their properties. And then, you know, as soon as they got here, guess what? All of them had cash in their pocket, and they were hiring contractors immediately. Clean this, so they were stimulating the economy. The first wave of economic activity, really on the island, from international at least, was homeowners coming here. And believe me, there was no tourists trying to come to this island. The tourists forgot about us yeah. at that point, and they will forget about us for a few years until, you know, we cleaned up. Right, but the homeowner couldn't wait to get on that flight because they want to check on their property. They, they have, have a vested interest. In the, They've got a gotcha. stake in yeah, our recovery as well. And a lot of them do a lot of uh, philanthropic uh, efforts that go undocumented. So they might throw a bonus into that housekeeper's hand or the gardener's hand. Um, I, I've known of so many different stories where they, you know, they bought prescription glasses for the the, the caretakers, you know, kids or, or whatever. Just on and on. There's just just. There's so many different um, philanthropic efforts that go undocumented, um, but it's definitely a benefit to the economy that's coming from this demographic, uh, which clearly is the, the, the most important tourism demographic. And I think it'd be in our interest um, to treat these people like they're welcome. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying they're treated like they're unwelcome, uh, but there are little things we could do. For example... A separate line in immigration, maybe, or at least allow them to join the resident line, or I don't know. Just th that's just a, a random example I'm pulling off the top of my head. Yeah. But there are little incentives you can do to make them feel proud. Like for example, when a non-resident buys a property here, what if they got a letter from the governor saying, "Hey, thank you for in investing in our country." Um, so just that, little things that like that. That would be more probably. It'd be awesome. To, yeah. It'd be yeah. awesome. I don't think it's it's that complicated to do. Honest, 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 it's honest, not like honest. we're selling millions of you know. It's a few hundred a year, if that. So it's definitely doable, but little things to show, hey, you guys are appreciated. Um, so I think it could, could would be helpful. Con considering your years um, in the business, what what makes it Martin that attractive for people to, to purchase a home here? Why why Ooh. Saint Martin? Why not Puerto Rico, Saint Kitts? Uh, yeah, uh, so. uh, well, while understanding that some other countries may have laws as far as uh, non residents purchasing so land, but why? What makes so the market? First thing that's important to note: we're not the only island in the Caribbean that people are investing in. So it's a very real competitive market. So the region in itself is very competitive. Um, there are a lot of second home buyers that choose other islands over St. Martin for whatever reason. But the clientele that I work with and um, the non residents or the majority of non residents I work with, some of the reasons they choose St. Martin, I'd say diversity is the best way to summarize it. So I'd say St. Martin's probably not the best at anything in the Caribbean, but we're among the best in a lot of different categories. So we've got some of the best restaurants in the Caribbean. We may not have the best beach. We've got some great beaches on this island. Yes, yes, we've yes. got great nightlife. Um, you know, the adult entertainment is, has, say what you will about it, it has a lot of pull uh, internationally. Um, in, in general, I don't know. I think just the diversity. So you can come for that. You can come for the sin. You can also come for the wholesomeness, mm -hmm. right? So just it, 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 it <laughs> offers such a, a it yeah, but it offers that. such a broad mm -hmm. range, which you're not going to find on any other island. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, and of course, the French Dutch, that just, again, plays into the whole diversity theme. Um, I find the Dutch side probably a little bit more Americanized and the French side very European. Yeah. And, and as, as the whole saying goes, you know, ways. European but Caribbean, you know, a little yeah. European, a lot of Caribbean. Um, so I think that, um, y yeah, the diversity that you find, also diversity in terms of the people, right? So there's like a hundred different nationalities on this island. I've learned so much about geography just from interacting with people that I meet on this island. Um, I've met people from every, probably, you know, definitely every continent and probably every country, you know. Um, so the diversity yeah, of people. Yeah, that. Um, having worked at a hotel, I answer my thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. The diversity of people, diversity of things to do, diversity of food, um, so I think diversity is what separates us from other destinations in the Caribbean. Okay. All right. And um, uh, even as you mentioned that, well, you know, there's one question that you usually t tend to see on Facebook. Typically, um, yeah. often uh, you hear it on the streets and discussions and so forth. Why is land so expensive? 
Great. What mm-hmm. fact? What are the factors that that go into yeah, the price you know, of land? It's um, it's sad but true. Uh, a lot of locals have been priced out of the market here in St. Martin, um, and it comes down to supply and demand. So, look, if you own a piece of land and you're going to develop that land, right? You you have the option. You can develop it to target somebody that's in a lower income bracket or I've, I've spoken to a lot of developers, for example, that want to build homes for the local population that have been priced out. They're willing to cut their margins, work on lower margins. But right now, the cost of construction is high. So it starts off as a great vision. And then as we get down to the brainstorming and the detailing and the pricing, the numbers start creeping up. I've been through this cycle with many different developers where the intention is to, to build. But, you, but this is also, sorry, but this yeah. is also, you would say, pre-Irma when, you know, pre-Irma and construction post-Irma. price was still uh, yeah, manageable, even, perhaps? Yeah, and, you know, so because there's interest from abroad, the non-residents that come here, as we mentioned, it's a second or third home. They typically have a lot more disposable income than the average resident here on island. And this tends to drive pricing up. Um, and there's pros and cons to that because, again, we pointed out how important these people are for the economy to survive and grow and recover, especially in times of crisis, these people who buy second and third homes. Aside, uh, you know, uh, the, the consequence of that is it increases the values of real estate on the island. And then for people who are working on minimum wage or even above that, um, the class dual income, dual, yeah, the middle class of St. Martin and, and below is priced out from a lot of these opportunities. And I think the real, there's, there's no easy solution to this. Yeah, I wish I could say, if we do this, it'll be solved. Yeah. No, yeah, this is, like, this is yeah, something that is... Yeah, because you can say, well, okay, at what point then do we... The, should we or do we decide that, well, uh, we're going to put a pause on, on non residents purchasing land or purchasing home on, on the island at the that, same time? I don't know if that's a good idea, though. Finding um, ways to, to, to further stimulate or, or transform our economy. So I, I would say the focus shouldn't be on trying to drive pricing down of real estate because that really has detrimental effects. It means, so a lot of locals own property here. Don't get me wrong, just because we're commenting on non residents who have more purchasing power. There's a lot of locals here with purchasing power who are heavily invested in real estate. And if the goal now or the strategy becomes to drive pricing down, these people lose a lot of wealth. And in general, I don't think it's good for the island's economy to say, hey, real estate values have just come down 50%. While some people might see that as an opportunity, oh, now I can finally buy a piece of land. No, you're buying into a very unstable economy now, uh, into a real estate market where the bottom is falling out. That's not a good investment. So rather than focusing on how can we drive pricing down, I think the conversation should really be how can we increase the purchasing power of locals? How can we increase that? Or maybe can we create certain re- uh, opportunities that are subsidized, that are exclusive for local buyers? Mm. So maybe government needs to step in and subsidize a development um, and say, look, you have to fit this parameter to be able to buy in here. Um, that's one way to per- perhaps create lower income housing. But again, I think there should be more of a focus on how can we increase the purchasing power of the population. Understood. Yeah. yeah understood. Yeah. Because, well, uh, as far as the subsidy, well, the project I'm referencing wasn't a subsidy, but it was an a investment for particularly local, inv- um, uh, let's say the, our locals, uh, middle class, particularly civil servants, um, the sure. APS. Correct. Yeah, the Oryx. The Oryx. Oh, yeah, Oryx. Um, yeah, the Oryx project, let's say. Correct. Um, yeah. But those price points were not affordable for the locals at large, let's say, or for, for the, the, there were still challenges with some of those price points, but yes, that was a good yeah. initiative. But I would I, say yes, the yeah. concept there, they, yeah. we, can, we can critique that and say it wasn't perfectly executed, let's say, but the intention was right. But it's and, a, and that's an example of... of I'm uh, glad you mentioned that because uh, you, 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 you mentioned um, finding ways in which we can increase the purchasing power of our people. Mm-hmm. Uh, why? Because even with that project, when I interviewed the director of APS, he yes. said one of the issues that they realize is that um, when it comes down to the requirements to be able to, uh, to qualify, to qualify and so forth, for sure. Well, some of the main issues is the setbacks where we uh, um, we tend to have loans, car loans, sure. and, and different They're loans or debts that... You right. know, that uh, yeah, it's 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 like right, so a self-imposed barrier in a sense. Yeah, so a lot of times, you know, we have buyers here that have put themselves in a position where they're not bankable, let's say, or, or they have so much exposure, they can't take on another mortgage. So it's, it comes down to prioritizing financial education. Um, and that's something I think should be taught in schools. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you know, that's, that's been established, I think, at this point. Yeah, especially. you need to teach financial education in schools. 
Um, because right now, the way it is, you have to teach yourself that for, for the most part, for right? Most part. So you've got to read books. You've got to un- understand that. Not everyone does that. And not everyone gets the right sources uh, for that either. So, um, yeah, it's pr- it's, there's uh, some systematic changes that are going to be required to, to, to solve this. And it's not a quick fix. It's a long-term solution. And, again, you refer to the, the RX project. Again, I think that concept, w- we need to see more projects perhaps with that concept. But as you pointed out, there was not really a government subsidy there to drive the price down. It was just yeah, – because yeah, so, apparently, well, even like with the Vinian Heights project, although that kind of um, – Took a took a, a sharp left turn. Sharp left turn. Yes. <laughs> yeah. To say, yes. Um, <laughs> to say that. I think yeah. if I'm not, if not, if if I remember well, when the discussion came up with with figuring out well what is affordable for for locals, I think the mm. p- the price range was around let's say a hundred a hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So mistaken. below two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is so where there's there's a real so gap. Sweet, yeah. There's spot. a real gap in the market under two hundred fifty thousand. So there's a lot of dual income households. So you know husband and wife both working um and they can really only qualify you know for plus minus 250 bracket or under 250 or under and very hard to find inventory in that bracket yeah extremely difficult yeah extremely challenging because i remember what came to what come to mind now too is um uh it was i guess it was a seminar that was held by um emilio and and henry yeah yeah sure sure and in his presentation, particularly uh, mentioned, well, I also identifying your need versus your want. Uh, Correct. Because you could want a certain particular type of house, but what Correct. type of house do you need when you factor in how many children do you have? Or do you, do you even have children? Or are you married? Or do you plan to get married? Sure. Um, yeah. And, and then you look at the just the land supply of the island, mm-hmm. um, the cost itself. Sure. So these are well, factors. you know, real estate is, is one of the best ways to create generational wealth. Uh, which is why it's important. Um, Can you see the high interest right now? In yeah, yeah, yeah. For locals and international. Correct. Yeah, but it's the be- one of the best ways to create generational wealth. If you can pass on a f- you know property that's paid off to your heirs, that gives them a head start in on on their you know uh, quest for financial freedom. Let's see. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think home ownership is something that you know I- I'd love to see every Saint Martin benefit from or have that opportunity. Um, and sometimes you may have to look at it. Maybe I can't afford my dream home, but at least let me invest in real estate. Maybe I'll get an apartment that I rent out. You know, if you know, I've got too many kids, I can't live in that small apartment. But maybe um, from an investment perspective, instead of a new car, maybe that might make a more make a little more sense. You, you scrape enough together for a down payment. You purchase a property that's going to rent. Um, I would suggest find something that's going to rent for what the more monthly payment will be, the monthly mortgage payment. So essentially, you let that property pay for itself over the years. Um, there might be a few months where you'll have to carry that mortgage when it's not rented, but for the most part, you can find a property that help pay for it, that pretty much pay for itself through the rental income or oh, joint or joint then, investment. Yeah, yes. and, and then when that's paid off 10, 20 years from now, you sell that property. You now have a liquidity, right? You have a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, whatever it's worth at that time, but it, it it's it's a way of planning for your future and it so from a cash flow perspective you would have been out your deposit and maybe the few months that you had to float the mortgage but over 20 years that's insignificant for the um the bigger picture yeah. but you got it requires sacrifice yeah and and, and planning you and got to f- action. add that wealth wealth is built um in time yes yeah, not, yes yes not, it's not overnight not it's quick, not overnight no. yeah yeah it's yeah. not overnight so Okay, so um, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. You're tuned into the news behind the news on Mix 94.7 FM. Uh, this is Ralph Kintav, and I'm joined with Mr. Arun Jaktiani. Jaktiani, my <laughs> bad, messing up your name. Sorry, Arun Jaktiani, the um, founder, uh, CEO of um, Island Real Estate Team. And we're having quite an interesting conversation yes, on real estate. Indeed. I think this is also a conversation that definitely will be continuing um, because it's, it's a pretty broad topic. Um, yeah, for sure. And there's lots to talk about, and there will be more to talk about. For um, sure. But we last left off, basically, Arun speaking on, uh, yeah, we answered the question as to why land is expensive. Yeah. Um, and we do have a supply and demand Supply and demand is what to, it boils consider. down to. Mm-hmm. And it's a good thing that there's interest in the market. Um, it's a good thing that there's people willing to pay premiums to be in St. Martin. Um, but, of course, the negative side of that is it prices out a lot of locals. So we need to look at ways to maybe at least protect a few opportunities for locals um, and also increase the purchasing power. Yeah. And those are both long-term solutions. Yeah. There's no quick fix. 
Um, at least not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Quick yeah. fix for that. So um, one of the things to consider, I would like for you to touch on, sure. is the factors as to what should people look out for when, they, when they're about to purchase a home? What, what do people need to consider? Yeah, so first things first, I always recommend um, know what you're working with. So speak to the bank, speak to your lender, uh, your financial advisor. Know how much money you're working with. That's, that's the first place I think you should start. Know what you, how much access to money you have. Um, based on that, then you should search the market within those price ranges because um, there's nothing worse than falling in love with a property and then finding out you can't afford it. And you've already kind of envis- you know, visualized yourself living there. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's a roller coaster crash. And some people never recover from it. Some people go through that experience and they say, I'm never going to put myself through that up and down again. And they kind never like get real estate again. Yeah, they get, well. yeah, yeah, they get hurt. So know, know your, your limitations. Um, then I would say find a credible agent, a good agent that is going to expose listings to you on the market. So that's going to say, okay, you, you're, you can afford in this price range. These are some options in this price range. Um, and here are, supple, here are a few options inside and outside of your price range as well, just in case. Um, yeah, and then you, you, you've got to identify what your, you, your needs and wants are, right? Like as you were mentioning. And you've got to be willing to be a little flexible on that. Um, because it's going to be very hard in most cases, unless you have an unlimited budget, to find a property that's going to check every single box. Yeah, you're going to have to give on something, yeah, whether view or size or location or something. Um, so have your have you list of priorities, let's say, and and be willing to be flexible. Mm-hmm. And you got to take action. You got to get out there and look at properties. Um, and most importantly, you got to take action. When you actually find one, it's... You know, you've got yeah. to have the courage to, to put in an offer and, and try to follow through on it. Because they're, they're not just maybe, there definitely is um, it's gonna more move. than one individual. Yeah, if it's a really good deal, it's going to move. Yeah. It's going to move quick gotcha. if it's a really good deal. You so. know, one of the things you said um, that is often highlighted with real estate uh, reminds me of a, a house, house of cards um, mm. in respect to power. And sure. It's all yeah. about location, location, location Absolutely. That, you oft- that you often hear. And I would add into that as well timing. Hmm. Timing is very important. Location, 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 right? That's the, the, the three rules of investing in real estate. And I definitely agree with that. But um, timing is very critical. Uh, they say the money you make in real estate is made on the buy, not on the sell. And that, so, so when you buy at the right time, buy low, sell high, right? Mm-hmm. But timing is what is a big dictator in that as well. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, even as we talk about um, needs and wants, mm-hmm. um, one of the factors we have to consider is, you know, um, cha- things change. And again, you mm-hmm. know, um, Samarna has been built up. Our capacity has changed. And even the, the housing styles. Sure. So, you know, back in the day, of course, it was way easier to have standalone homes with a huge yes. yard. Yeah. Maybe back and front yard. Yeah. Um, now you see that kind of shifted to very big block homes mm-hmm. sometimes a little parking <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're now seeing more modernist modern touches uh, condo styles you can see more high rises because yeah. as land becomes more scarce instead of building out we've got to build up yeah and I think that's going to be a, a, a trend coming into the fu- into the coming decades as well uh, mm-hmm. you can see more and more of that mm-hmm. and I, I know there's a lot of mixed feelings on that but yeah because of what you're used to you know? yeah of course mm-hmm. of course and uh, again in, in some ways it'd be beautiful to go back to the picturesque St. Martin we see from you know the 70s um, but then it doesn't allow for some of the comforts we've, we've grown used to as well. And, do, you know, then there's no way we can go back to what we were in the 70s, right? It's just mm-hmm. not possible. So um, it's kind of spilt milk in a way, right? You just yeah. got to accept this is where we are. Let's yeah. make the best of where we are right yeah. now, which is still amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's still beautiful. Correct. It's still uh, great. So Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess part of the discussion is really then what, what from the past can we learn from? It, that's that's yeah. very valid. As yeah, far exactly. As like whether it was the, it was the filling of the pond or sure, the Sure, we can say it was not developed the, the best way or whatever. You can yeah. say, oh, if they would have done this instead of that, it'd be better for, you know. But we have to kind of use that foresight and wisdom moving forward. We can't, we can't rewind. So... So what are, what are the drawbacks you've noticed um, that take place, you know, or, or that make people hesitant um, from purchasing a home? Um, you know, access to money is, is always a big thing. That's like the underlying. A- access to money. Yeah, purchasing power is a big thing. It, it, it really becomes a limiting factor. And beyond that, okay, if let's say money is not the issue. Um, then it's really p- personal choice. So it's going to be different for everybody. Some people want to fix her up or somebody, some people want it just turnkey. They don't have to do a thing. Some people want to be close to the ocean. Some people want to be far from the ocean. They want to be up on a hill. Views, 
imperative for some people and for some it's not the biggest or mo most important so, so more it becomes more personalized after that gotcha. but access to money is is the biggest barrier for okay. sure yeah all right so then that's okay <laughs> that's interesting you say that um and what do you what do you say that there's um any uh legislation that 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 could be put in place so maybe better regulate the real estate industry or do you find that um as is um it's 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 fine there's always room for improvement there's definitely room for improvement um but we have to be careful when we ask for new legislation um i think one area definitely i would love to see is some kind of licensing of agents i think that's important because what we experience uh when the market gets really busy everybody's trying to sell real estate so mm -hmm. people who don't really know anything about real estate transactions but just happen to be in a good networking position um and i'm not picking on anybody yeah I but got you. you have certain professions that interact with a lot of people great they're service oriented great and they might find themselves w where they're trying to broker deals um because they happen to know a buyer and seller but they don't really know the details of a real estate transaction or what's involved and that can become very dangerous mm -hmm. um, because if they give bad advice, this is a large investment. It can come with a lot of collateral damages for everyone involved. So I would like to see some licensing of, of agents. Um, but then again, you have to be careful what you wish for because I don't want to have a situation where I'm screaming for this and government appoint somebody who doesn't really understand the industry to create a bunch of rules for us. Uh, so I, I, I'm very careful on what I wish for, yeah, but gotcha. uh, yeah, gotcha. it'd be good. It'd be good. I think it'd, it'd be important to have it properly regulated uh, for agents, where agents are concerned that um, if you're going to do this, you got to take it serious. Whether you do it part time or full time, you should take this serious. Yeah, like this is my livelihood, right? This is what I do from the morning I wake up to go to sleep, and I take it very serious. Like certain industries, like uh, what is like say paramedics or the banking industry and so forth. Yeah, that there's a regulation yeah, for yeah. exactly. You yeah. can't just have entities, somebody entities that sh that pop up on scene. Yeah. Just because someone's good at debating doesn't allow them to work as a lawyer all of a sudden, yeah. right? So you might be good at networking, but that's only one skill set, and there's a whole vast of information you need to understand before you give advice on real estate. So. Um, I think people who are in that position who are making commissions on real estate transactions, they need to have been licensed or should be. Yeah. Gotcha. So I think that's one area we could definitely improve on. Okay. Um, so, yeah, as far as uh, the big ticket <laughs> items, um, the land yeah. tax, yeah. Uh, as well as long lease land. Um, yes. Uh, like you call those the big ticket items. Yeah, those are. <laughs> Indeed. Because, uh, uh, again, there's, there's still a lot of clarity that's needed. Um, um, yeah. from the side of government you know, to the public. Um, I did appreciate the, um, the Minister of Romy and Finance. They mm -hmm. did. Um, when the news came out, of course, it took it, it took its turn. Sure. Um, but it did clarify that basically the intention is not to just take back Correct. land. And from, I would hope not. Yeah, and I, I would hope not. But Yeah, take take back land from persons who um, are in arrears for, sure. for um, not paying um, their, I forget what it's called, um, the canon, the canon, yeah, yeah, the canon. yeah. So, yeah. Um, for for government land, but it's a matter of you know um, so ensuring I, that people now pay. Um, but uh, you know, so you I want to touch on that for one yeah, second, yeah, yeah. if you will. So yeah, go ahead. I can't make this up. I swear to you. When I was this morning, when I was driving, um, I was driving to an appointment this morning before coming here, and I got a call from a Canadian gentleman who purchased a property here in St. Martin. It happens to be on government long lease land. He read all those articles in the paper and everything, and so he calls me and he says, Arun. I don't know how to pay my gov my annual canon fee. I said, w what do you mean? He said, I emailed Vromi, and the person I contacted said I need to contact somebody else who they copied on the email. I emailed them. It's been three weeks. I've had no response. So earlier this week, they went down to the vineyard building and said, hey, we want to pay. We don't, you know, they, we understand our obligation. We want to pay. Who do we pay? How much do we owe? And the person they spoke to and, look, you know, looked them up in the system or whatever and says, oh, well, you only thing I see in the system is you owe for a building permit. And they're like, we paid for that building permit. Mm. And anyway, through a little investigation then, because they get very concerned, like, wait a minute, we paid for that permit. What are you talking about? Apparently that had been sitting in just a holding account for like the past six months. So it's not even been dispersed. Whoa. Okay. And then, like I said, I, I'm not, I can't make this stuff up. Um, so the money's in the ho it's not even dispersed. Uh, and still... After spending an hour plus at the Vineyard Building, they still don't know how much they owe, where to pay, and who to pay. And no one in the... And they couldn't and get a straight answer on this. They didn't go to receivers at any time before? I, I, I don't know. This is the... I don't know if they went to receivers or not. I don't know if they know where receivers is. Uh, again, they are... They own a vacation home here. 
right? And only for, to read but these articles. Yeah, but so even, yeah, but I guess you're saying. Though, so it should, just that it, so it's, it's one thing yeah. that the ministers issue this statement, people need to pay the canon. But you need to make it easy for them to pay the canon. We're in 2021, right? It should yeah, not be right. these old-fashioned methods of go to this office, go to that office, get a stamp here, go to that office, and come back to this office, and I'll tell you, go to that office. And... This is what I'm talking about as well. We need to show an appreciation for international investors who buy property here. I'm not saying that locals should get, you know, horrible treatment and, and non-residents get good treatment. We should all be getting equal, equally good treatment. Correct. But you, can you imagine how frustrating it is for someone who's bought a vacation home here? They don't know the culture le here, let's say. You and I grew up with this yeah. running around so we can laugh it off a little bit. Something. But for them, <laughs> they're kind of lost. Mm -hmm. They're like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Is somebody targeting us and they don't want to tell us what we have to pay? So they started... Yeah, especially factoring the fact that, well, they're told that they owe of a, of a permit. Which they paid for already. Yeah. And then they, they, you know, yeah. through asking the questions or whatever and showing their receipts. Oh, it's here in a holding... Really? Sitting in a holding account? Our government crying for money. They got money that's been paid and just sitting in a holding account? So I think there's also... I follow you. Yeah, so... so yes, I agree with the minister's statement. If you owe land... If you're supposed you're, to be paying uh, yes. land lease fees, you need to be paying them. Correct. But shame on government for not streamlining that process. Yeah. Uh, I'd say that as well. So one of the things uh, that you also mentioned is that uh, you're personally not in favor of, um, let me, I think I have it written here. Sure, you're sure, personally sure. not in favor of paying for renewal of the, of the, of the permit. Okay. Of the, of, so of the fees, this, sorry. Is, this is, this is a major issue. Um, Renewal of the rights. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, when the ministers of Vrami and Finance issued that statement, I don't think they were thinking the worst case scenario that I was. Yeah, my mind went down a different path. I, I agree with what they were trying to say. So they're saying, if you owe land lease fees, you need to pay them. Great. I, I agree with that statement, thousand plus percent. Yeah. What's happening behind the scenes that perhaps was not taken into consideration. Um, so we have an issue where a lot of neighborhoods on this island are in government long lease land. Let's take Point Blanche for an example. Almost mm -hmm. all of Point Blanche is government long lease land. If you own a house there, you pay a canon fee to government every year for the use of the land, right? And you own the house on top. A lot of those leases are starting to come to expiration now. Um, it's the first time in the history of St. Martin, let's say, since they issued these long leases, where you're going to have a large amount of these leases maturing now. Gotcha. So let's say you own a house. Paid off for 20 years, you retired, you're living in this house in Point Blanche, you're paying your canon fee every year to government. Now the lease expires in 2023, let's say, or 2022, whatever. You go to government, this is, so you're going to go to government and say, hey, I want to renew my land lease. What do I owe? Um, I don't mind there's an administrative fee or whatever, but because there is no clear legislation in place. This is my understanding. I'm not a lawyer. This is what I've been told by lawyers and notaries and people a lot smarter than me who've told me, who've explained this to me. And I hope I can articulate it well enough that people listening can understand. But basically, when you go to renew your long lease fee, because there's no clear policy in place as to how this is supposed to be renewed, they treat it like you're getting a new deed from a taxation perspective which means you pay a new transfer cost, a closing cost. And I have two examples that happened. So this is not something I'm making up or, um, or trying to spread fear. This has happened to two different individuals where they had to pay based on the value of the house and the land. Government had, don't own nothing on, has nothing to do with the house, th if you think of it that way, right? But you had to pay now 5% of what the market value, based on an appraisal, to renew this long lease land. That could be significant. So if you bought a house, if it's worth 200000 you're going to pay close to $10,000 in fees. If it's half a million, you're paying about $20,000 in fees. If it's a million dollar house, you're paying $50,000. What at 5%? Yeah, plus minus. Um, that's highway robbery. Uh, I can understand an administrative fee to renew the long lease. Maybe even taxing it just on the land value. Even that I'm not in favor of, but it, we can have that discussion. But to base it on the market value of the land and the improvements, it's crazy. And now the widespread concern for this. So pretty much all of Point Blanche. Or, and there's several other neighborhoods on island that this is going to impact. Let's use Point Blanche as, as the case study. So if you own a house in Point Blanche, let's say you're retired now. You're on a fixed income. You paid off your 20-year mortgage. You're chilling. You go to renew your long lease. All of a sudden, you're getting a $20,000, $30,000 bill just to stay in your home. Right. And now, so this is what 
because I know this has been happening behind the scenes, when the ministers issued that statement about if you're not up to date on your canon fees, we can take the land back kind of thing. So I said, so what happens to these families now that can't renew their long lease land? Are you going to take their home from them? Because essentially when you make that statement, that's what you're setting the stage for, whether you meant to set that stage or not, which I don't think they were even thinking along this concern. And I also want to point out, I've been asking Vromi going on a year and a half now, or a year and change, sorry, a year and change. Sorry for that little exaggeration. I've been asking for about a year. Um, Can they please confirm what is the fees involved in renewing the long lease land? Uh, and I can't get an answer. Going on a year and change. I've even used the ombudsman to try clarify this point for me. Can't get an answer. So you've sent letters, can't get an answer. updates, calls? Yes, yes. Emails. Oh. It's all documented, even via the ombudsman's office. And ombudsman can't get an answer for me either. So I think that's very concerning. Extremely concerning. Because that's an important issue. Um, hmm. Another major factor with government long lease land, if you own a property in government long lease land and you want to sell that property, you need the minister to sign off, to assign those long lease rights to the new buyer. If you own your home, you should have the right to sell that whenever you want, right, in my opinion. Uh, That's fair. The challenge is now, because we need Vromi to sign off on those long lease lands, um, they're having major administrative flaws, issues. uh, It takes almost a six months to a year to get them to sign off now. And I've been doing this for 18 years. I can tell you, for most of my career, that was a process that took 10 days to two weeks. Then it stretched out to maybe a month. And in the last few years, it's gone from a few months to almost a year. In some cases, over a year. Every notary in this island, I guarantee you, has a case that's lasted over a year where they couldn't transfer ownership because they're waiting on on Vromi to sign off. Yeah, and and Sibo, what do you... This year, (laughs) no, this is where... So, you know, looking at the society from sure. Eagles, Eagles uh, sure. uh, perspective, uh, this is where you see persons like ourselves. So you're here giving mm-hmm. me this interview, highlighting the issue. Um, we have a parliament, you know, that's for, yes. that, that, that's responsible for basically sure. oversight, fixing these sort of problems sure. um, in government and executing. Um, what what you explained there really, it's, it's an issue because one, um, it clearly shows that there's not enough um, checks and balances. Correct. Because the granting of powers to ministers uh, due to lack of policy, um, which leave room for... Um, Incorrect procedures. Uh, uh, correct. And, 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 and uh, a history that Simon already have where vindication is concerned mm. and so forth. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, so these yeah. are realities where, okay, we need st- more black and white uh, barriers, let's say, so, to, to ensure you know, a, a due and fair process. So another question I've posed to Vromi as well uh, for over a year, and again, also via the ombudsman, is how long should one expect if they're trying to sell their property on Gumbel Longley's land, how long should they be waiting to get permission from government. It's not really permission. You just got to sign off. They need to inspect and see what it is and make sure you're selling what, um, you know, make sure the land was not developed uh, or it was developed in accordance with what the purpose was allowed to be. Yeah, so if it's a family home, it's a family home, not a hotel on the land. You know, so they just got to verify that. It should not take a year to verify. Um, but anyway, so again, a year and change, I can't get a clear answer from Vromi um, as to what's a fair time frame. And this, these are two very important questions. You know, how much does it cost to renew a long lease and how long should it take to sell long lease land? These are imperative for my industry for the wheels of economy to turn. We need this. And actually, government, in my opinion, should facilitate these transactions as quickly as possible, especially post Irma, because guess what? As soon as that sale closes, there's tax revenue immediately in government coffers. There's local businesses that get a chance to make a little bit of money and pay taxes on that as well. But instead, sales take a long time. And I can tell you, it hurt our recovery post term and it's hurting our economy today. Yeah, because then it, it still touches on um, it uh, slows one of the down, main things economy. persons have an a issue with is um, the permits. <laughs> that's a whole so other company. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and not just with Romy, but even several other departments. That's, so, that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, so, so I think it's important. So it's, it's a, yeah, what you highlight hi- 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 is one in many examples of a, a, a serious capacity issue. Yeah, capacity issue, administrative roadblocks yeah. that are crippling the economy. Um, really, it's not allowing the wheels of economy to turn. Uh, it's like throwing a stick, you know, in the spokes of the wheel just to make it more challenging. Um, and, you know, these are things that are within our control. Yes. It's an internal. You can't come around and say, oh, we're Hollanding, allowing us to transfer the land. No, this is on us. Yeah. Right. You can point the finger at Holland for other things, but 
this is on us. Yeah. And this is to turn the wheels of our economy. Yeah. Um, so thank you for giving me a voice on this topic because it, it – um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a headline that gets lost in yeah, some it of the other headlines. Again, you know, yeah. so much stuff happens on St. Martin. It's a story that gets lost in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alone, we have yeah, two yeah. major headlines. So, yeah, yeah, you, know, you got a yeah. Bryson Tiff, you got a member of parliament resigning. I yeah, don't know, correct, it's, there's correct. always something, right? Yeah. So, um, but, and so I guess uh, finally on that, on that subject, another thing that, you know, people still want the clarity on because I do, mm-hmm. um, uh, which is the whole matter of the land tax and real estate sure. taxes. Sure. I know you also came up with a second article particularly. yeah. yeah. Um, highlighting that factor. So, so the Minister of Finance gave a presentation in Parliament about tax reform ideas, which tax reform is something I've been on the edge of my seat since we got country status, waiting to hear. We need tax reform. The business community out here is, who's compliant is overtaxed. Yeah? Um, anyway, that's, that's a much broader conversation. Yeah, yeah, that's I maybe, follow another, I that's follow maybe another show in, in itself. But as part of that presentation, he talked about introducing certain real estate taxes. And... I like the Minister of Finance. Again, I'm not being critical of anybody. Um, but I kind of felt a way, to be honest, that local stakeholders were not involved in the conversation. Uh, in that article that I read in the Herald, so maybe there's something no, that was lost what, what I'll clarify there is um, those proposals were from the IMF. Correct. Yes, yeah. correct. So he was just presenting what Fair. was. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And again, I'm, I'm basing everything I'm saying I on what I read in yeah, the paper. I got yeah, you. so yeah. maybe something is lost in translation. But what I... Read in the paper, what I understood from reading the article, the minister said, like, we're not going to seek advice from anyone else. And I think he since has issued the statement that he will contact local stakeholders. Yeah, yeah because in the, that the, initial the idea was to create, um, basically, the idea was to create a discussion, let's say. Yes, yeah, so, but the initial press release, and yeah. again, that's what the press release said. I'm not saying that's what the minister said. But gotcha. The press release said that the minister was not seeking any additional consultation. He spoke to these economists from... World Bank, IMF, wh- wherever. I'm sure they're all very qualified, very smart people. But I've served in the trenches here for 18 years. I understand things about this market that they couldn't possibly grasp from studying, you know, different charts. And, and I'm sure they can teach me things too, right? So I'm not discounting the value they bring uh, to the discussion. But I think it's important to understand the position from local stakeholders as well. So some of the comments, um, if you will, that that really caught my attention was... Uh, the comment of we will tax non-residents who own property here. Um, interesting concept. Uh, I'll touch on that. And also what was really confusing to me, uh, I believe the minister said he wanted to eliminate transfer tax, replace it with a turnover tax, which that also didn't really make sense to me. And I'll explain why in, in, in a second if we have the time. Um but on the concept of, let's touch first on taxing non-residents. Um, there's a lot of non-residents that own property here. And as we alluded to, the non-residents typically have more purchasing power than the local population. Uh, the local population in many ways, the full-time residents in many instances, is at a little bit of a disadvantage where it comes to purchasing real estate because we don't have the same purchasing power. So on that note, I'm all for creating a little bit of advantage for residents if and where it's fair and possible to do that. One more, sorry, one more comment but, that, that just yeah. came to mind because I think uh, one of the, the matters that came up was the fact that with the non-residents, they're, you know, they're generating income on the homes and not paying taxes, like with Airbnb and so forth and, and for vacation rentals. Sure, sure. And that's, for the most part, a big misconception. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on that in one second. That, okay. And that becomes almost a second conversation, I, I think. Okay. So, because not every non-resident who owns property here is renting. And there seems to be this perception that everyone who buys a second or third home, they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars on rentals. Not true at all. There is a f- there are a few, and, and they should be taxed, yeah? Um, but there's a lot of people that only use it for themselves. They lock it and leave it when they're not here. Maybe they send some friends or family to use the home. That's about it. They're not generating income. Then there are several th- th- who do rentals, but more so just to offset the carrying costs. So if you own a condo in some of these luxury buildings, there's monthly fees of you know over $1,000 plus to, to pay. So a lot of them who do rentals, it's really to offset just these kind of carrying costs. Um, it's not like they're making a tremendous return on, on investment. And it's not like they're taking home hundreds of thousands or whatever. And, and there are some that turn a profit. Yeah, and that should be taxable income. I, I agree with that. But to say that every non-resident who 
you, so it's two separate issues, right? You got to look at resident non -re first conversation non residents who own property. Here. So the minister said something to this effect: by taxing non residents who own property here, we don't have to go after the money they're making on Airbnb. Wrong. That's a very incorrect statement because the the two are not necessarily correlated. If you own, if you're a non resident, it does not mean you're renting and making money on Airbnb. So now you're going to overtax this person who's not even renting. And what about the locals that are renting on Airbnb? Because there are a lot of locals that, part, and that's great, that's good, but they should also be taxed on that income. I think fair yeah. is fair, so right? You see, what you're saying, though, b bottom line is really a matter of... Um uh, it's got to be looked two separate ways. Our so St. Martin's St. Martin's stepping up its game where uh, responsibility and, and control is, is is concerned. Sure. Well. Well. Yeah. So and, and also, first you got to streamline the process, right? So if you're going to text, I think, I think uh, we were going to meet, meet with Airbnb and and, and um, finally. So so what I'm saying is. Um, yeah. Due to a lack of structure, then uh, the industry and, and not just real estate, different different um, uh, segments of, of society, uh, people take advantage of it. Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, again, you've got to make the system easy to pay, right? Yeah. Uh, if they've got to go call Vinami, go Vineyard, run around here, there, to, at a certain point, you can say, to hell with it, I, I'm not paying. Uh, and I'm not saying that's always the case, but it does need to be simplified. Yeah, I think we can all agree the methods of payment for taxation should be simplified, yeah? Um, but to, to, so to touch on this, so first things first, I, I can agree with non-residents who own property here paying a small annual tax. That's, that's fine. But first, what is that tax? So I thought it was irresponsible for the minister to say we're going to tax these investors here on our island without giving us some kind of expectation. Are we talking 1000 a year? Are we talking 10000 a year? Because that matters yeah we're talking 100 dollars here so i think if you're going to say we're going to tax this at least give us some indication so what you're thinking I one. follow you yeah. yeah that's 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 one but also it's important because from decades we've been marketing this island to international buyers as you don't no annual real estate taxes so a question you asked me earlier what separates saint martin and, and i'm sorry i didn't touch on this i said diversity but when it comes down to making a buying decision nine out of ten international or non-residents who've bought here will tell you definitely something that caught the attention was no annual real estate taxes. Nine out of 10 people who choose this island over other islands in the Caribbean, it's because we have no annual real estate taxes, right? So you've been marketing this as, you know, what we offer. And now, so what my comment was, if we're going to introduce tax on non-residents, you got a grandfather in who's already invested. Yeah, you can't say to some, because some people might have just bought six months ago, 12 months ago, and all of a sudden you sold them, hey, no annual taxes, fooled you. Now you got this annual. So I, I was saying, no, you, you got to at least grandfather yeah, in follow those. You. And sure, you can draw a line now and say moving forward, non-residents will have to pay this tax. Yeah, for any, and even people who already own property, if they buy another property, that second property should be taxed, right? So it's not the individual that's grandfathered, it's the, the transaction or the ownership that's grandfathered in. Um, so I think that was important to define. Um, and also, if you're going to say you're going to introduce taxes, you should be clear. Now, next thing on the Airbnb rentals or, or vacation rentals, for people who are doing that, I think they should be charged. I think 5% TOT or 5% room rate, whatever you want to call it, is fair. I don't agree with them having to file a profit and loss at the end of the year because then it's like they have to hire an accountant to own the property here. And again, people who are buying a second or third home for vacation, they're looking for simplicity, quality of life. They're not looking for a complicated thing. Um, so I, I believe, you know, 5% off the booking. There's ways to integrate this to, to you know, if they integrated the immigration cards they, right there, you know, and, and most people are willing to be honest about this. They're not trying to hide this. Um, but it's not knowing what to do, not knowing how to pay. Um, so, I, yeah. I, again, I think 5% would be fair on all those bookings. And that's it. You shouldn't have to file profit and loss at the end of the year on your vacation home and hire an accountant because you own a vacation home. Um, and I also think another way they could generate revenue when this non-resident purchases the property, maybe they buy a rental card. So if you want to do vacation rentals, first things first, you got to buy this rental card, hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, nominal fee, nothing crazy. This allows you to do vacation rentals in country St. Martin. Yeah. As a non-resident, it's a small, it's just, but that hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, whatever that card, it should be a no brainer fee, but that's instant revenue for the island that will add up. Yeah. Um, 
and then you charge 5% of all bookings. And this is something that we can easily make deals with Airbnb and other, and Airbnb is not the only booking agent. There may be, might be the most popular, yeah. but there's a lot of other platforms that do the same service. Yeah, so you need yes. to make deals yeah, with these other right. platforms. There's even local agents that you can make arrangements with. But the, the press release that we're referring to said that the island could not make a deal with Airbnb. Why was that? Aruba made a deal. A lot of other destinations have made deals. I don't understand why we couldn't make a deal with Airbnb. Um, but anyway, you can, there's ways to get that. 5% locked in at the booking. It's paid by the consumer, paid directly to the tax office. There's no administration for the, for the property owner. And perhaps, again, we, we can implement a law. You've got to buy this annual card if you plan to do rentals. You don't want to do rentals, you don't buy the card. But then you won't be allowed to advertise it on certain platforms. And if you violate that, there's a fine. Um, I think that would be a much more simplistic way uh, to do it and a much more fair way as well. And then... Sorry, we were touching on locals being priced out. Mm -hmm. Another comment I have, or, or what I said is, I'm all in favor for locals having a few advantage or residents having a few advantages in the real estate market. Um, so, for example, I think residents should be allowed to own a certain amount of property that rental income is not taxed, um, up to a certain dollar amount, perhaps, 50000 a year, 100000 And anything after that, you pay tax. But give residents extra incentive, incentive to invest yeah. in real estate because again this is how you create generational wealth for the population right um so i, I think those are a couple ideas but uh, again i didn't really follow the minister's vision based on the article i read i've not had a conversation with them they've not invited me for conversation i leave that door open whenever they want to um i'd welcome the opportunity um but yeah that was uh that was my take from that article cool uh, so <laughs> I can go on and on, but I, know, I don't know if time will permit <laughs> yeah, to. So. We, we slightly past that, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I would like to thank you, Arun, uh, for coming pleasure, on. Pleasure, pleasure. Uh, basically, you know, the, for me, the main takeaway really is, uh, you know, when we decided we wanted to be a country, man, that meant that we had to run a tight chip, yeah. period. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I still look at it uh, as one of the main issues being um, that oversight, uh, regulation, and control mm -hmm. of, w of what's taking place. Sure. Because um, things still kind of function as a free for all um, to an extent. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also, even as far as the sharing, dissemination of information, um, you tend to see, well, a press release is sent out uh, or uh, articles written, um, it, cre it creates a stir then a clarification has to be made or right. if it creates a stir, sometimes there's a, a backpedaling of what was said. So, sure, know, which makes these conversations important so that, you know, we can really dig into it, uh, look, read between the lines. Well, uh, then, that's why I love the name of your show, <laughs> news, news Behind the News. Appreciate um, that, man. Yeah, man, great. So th thank you for having me here and I think there's uh, a, a lot more that we can talk on for on sure. this topic and other topics of taxation. So welcome the opportunity. And uh, thank you, man. Wish you much success with the show. Thanks a lot. And thanks for coming. And so to our viewers and listeners, I hope that you guys uh, also um, took away a lot of gems from this conversation and do take care.